uh, in, in, in the series that we're in right now, as you can probably see if you have a bulletin, it's on the front of the bulletin, Be the Church. As I've been thinking about this for some time and working through what we would look at and what we would study, uh, at the outset of that, I began to pray very specifically eight things for our church. And I want to look at those eight things today, but uh, specifically I'd like to look at the passage of Scripture that they came from and what else is there, because I see some great things there that I think as we look into the future of our church, as we look at who we are as people, as individuals, as collectively as a church, how do we define that? What do we do? How does this work? And and working through some of that kind of stuff. but, But there are eight things that I have been praying very specifically for our church. First, that God would captivate our hearts. No matter what we do, no matter how we program, no matter what we plan or teach or anything, uh, we can't captivate our hearts. Only God can do that. And so asking God that he would capture us, our attention and our, our minds and our wills and our thoughts and captivate our hearts. The second thing, is asking God if he would continue to bring a sense of awe. And even this week, as we saw very quickly, the leaves, the leaves, the leaves, not the leaves. I saw, saw Whitey look up quick when I said the leaves. The leaves bursting out of the end of the branches this week, so quickly. Um, the birds singing, uh, the grass turning green, uh, the sense of awe just in creation alone. But that every day, in day-to-day things, that God would just bring a sense of awe of who he is. I've been praying that God would show his miraculous power. And I wish that you could be in on or be a fly on the wall in my office sometimes. So constantly right now, conversations with people who are just lighting up and lights are coming on, and they're getting into Scripture. They're in new life groups, and they're engaged and excited. And God is bringing change in people's lives, and it's exciting. And in that, too, very similar, that God would constantly confirm his presence. Here in us as a church, as, individual, as individuals, in our programs, we know that God is here but to show us, to open our eyes, to see what he is doing all of the time. And that's one of the things we pray for the men's often and the and men's prayer meeting on Wednesday morning is that God would just open our eyes that we could see the things he's doing day after day. Boy, wouldn't that alone be a sense of joy or, or, or a source of joy? I'm praying next that God would give us a togetherness, a singleness of purpose, of mission, and, and bring us together, praying that God would give us joy, that we would be a people characterized by joy, and praying that God would give us favor with people outside our church, in our community, in, our, in the businesses, people that are tourists and people on our streets, that we would have favor there. And lastly, that God would bring new people, and not necessarily people coming from other churches, but that people would be seeing Jesus and finding Jesus, that people would come to know him as our Lord and that our church would grow because of that. These are eight things that I have been praying for quite a while as I prepared for these series of messages. Let's pray. Let's start right with those things right now. Oh Lord, our God, we are in awesome wonder because you are good. And God, as we gather today and as we go into your word, I ask that you would make your word come alive. Let us see your truth. Captivate us, compel us towards you. And God, in these eight things, I ask that you would captivate our hearts. That you would dominate our hearts and our mind and our will. But God, in the sense of awe that we want you to bring, boy, that would captivate our hearts. And these things come together. Bring a sense of awe. Show us your miraculous power. Confirm your presence in our midst. This is all about you. It's not about us. 
God, may we see you at work in miraculous ways. God, give us a togetherness. Give us joy. Give us community and richness and depth in relationship and love. But not just for each other here. God, may we express that clearly to the people who live on our streets and we work with and we rub our shoulders with, the people um, that wait, us, wait on us at restaurants, uh, the people who pump our gas. God, may we give us favor with these people. But God, because of you, where your Holy Spirit is in our lives, the evidence of that is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God, make us those people. And God, would you add people to your kingdom. Add people to our church who are finding Jesus. Bring life transformation. So God, we lift these things to you. And now God, in the next few minutes as we dig into your word, as I said, would you open our eyes to see. Your word is alive. It's living and active. And God, move us today because we've been in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to take a few minutes and really kind of go all the way around like this and arrive right back where we just were. And I want to talk about those things that I've been praying, but, but in order to come back to that, I want to explain to you how I got there and where these eight things came from, that passage of Scripture, uh, how that came alive in my own life, and where we went. And, and in the middle of that, and in that process... It was part of reshaping, uh, reshaping what we do as a church. So I want to kind of work with all of you. Stay with me. In a few minutes, we'll end up right back where we started, okay? I want to start by, uh, in, in, from 1998 to 2007, I was youth pastor in a church called Rock Point Church. And it was a really, really unique time period. It was the years uh, of... of God's special touch and anointing on our church. We've said lots of times that he just had a window of blessing open. Our church grew from 150 to 1,600 people uh, in, in just a few years, in multiple services, in locations all across the city. And almost all of that growth was people finding Jesus for the first time. Along with that church growth meant that me as a youth pastor, our, our youth group grew, grew. And I started in that church in 1998 with about eight teenagers. And in just a few years, we had 300 of them gathered. All of a sudden, I had a problem. Because everything we've always done in youth group before, we can't do. Right? We couldn't get on a bus and go bowling. When we'd go to, we'd plan laser tag, and I don't know if you've ever been laser tag. We should do it together one time. It, it is quite fun. But luckily, we were in Calgary, and there's eight laser tag venues. Well, we would have to book five of them on the same night and send buses in different directions. It was just completely changed everything we were going to do. So in order to do this, as we were trying to figure this out, I took all of my volunteers away for a weekend, and we spent the entire weekend dealing with this, evaluating this, thinking and dreaming, and praying and in Scripture, looking for what God would have us do. And we came to Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. I'm going to refer back to it in and out over the course of the morning, but everything we're going to talk about, all of this prayer and all of the things we did as a church and we ought to do as a church uh, can come from that and be sourced from that. But one of the th phrases... At the end of Acts chapter 2 is that this group of people met every day in the temple and met every day in their homes. And that started us as a group of youth leaders. It started us on a conversation about if we had big group stuff and we had little group stuff, how do we do those well? Because there's things we can do in a big group with hundreds of kids 
that we cannot accomplish in a group of five or six. And vice versa. There's things we can do in a group of five or six that will never be accomplished in a group of 100 people or 200 people. So what is the best thing we can do? We got into conversations with several hundred teenagers. How do we do the real deep relational stuff well? That was easy when there was 30 kids. How do we do the real intimate challenging, life-changing growth, the spiritual growth things with that many kids in a room. Well, we had over 100 kids in our grade 5 and 6 program. And it was awesome. They were bringing friends. Kids were coming to Christ. New families were coming because their kids were engaged. And it was happening like crazy. But as you probably know, many of you may have taught a grade five boys Sunday school class. Try doing that with 50 boys in the room. It was a great problem to had, have, but we had to figure this out. So we sat down and we worked through our values. What are the most important things we needed out of this? Community and relationships was very clear. We wanted to have inseparable packs of kids. Bible study and learning and, and, and application of truth was absolutely non-negotiable. We wanted as high value that people and kids, whether they're in grade 5 or grade 12, uh, would be authentically following Jesus. We wanted to serve the poor and the people in our neighborhood and we wanted to have fun. So we started with these values, and we continued to pray, we continued to, to seek God, and we landed in Acts chapter 2. So here's where I want to go this morning. And, and just to give you the background, and I know most of you know this passage of Scripture well, Jesus has just ascended to heaven. If you were here last week, we talked about Matthew chapter 28, which is just before Jesus ascended to heaven. And he gave them his instructions to go into the world and make disciples and baptize them and teach them. Teach them the way I taught you and the things I taught you, then you teach them. His instructions for what they ought to do uh, in, in the church that was just going to launch. And Jesus ascended to heaven and said, wait for the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit comes. And early in this book of Acts, we see very clearly that when the Holy Spirit comes on them, there was this miraculous, indwelling presence of God, giving them the power to do exactly what he had asked them to do and what was right in front of them. And immediately, these men and women were filled with passion. They were filled with boldness and understanding and drive and mission. And what did they do immediately then? They got out of their meeting. That was fantastic. They got out of their meeting and went to where the people who didn't know Jesus were. And that's where we pick this passage up. And so they, they, uh, they were preaching to this group of people. And I want to pick it up in verse 37 of Acts chapter 2. And now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? So they saw the truth. They knew it. They got it. They put the dots together. And he had given them a, a, a Jewish history lesson that led to Jesus. And it was clear. They knew that this was truth. They knew they needed to respond. It cut them to their heart. We've got to get this sorted out. Tell us what to do. Verse 38. And Peter said to them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many, many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. I'm going to pause there for a second, because this is, this is the part of Scripture now I want to get to. All right, So this is all background. But think about this. 3,000 people added that day, all of them brand new believers in Jesus. 
This is exactly what Jesus asked them to do, right? Go, make disciples, baptize them. But now what? To continue what Jesus asked them to do is now we have to start teaching them and discipling them the way Jesus did with them. So they've got to start pulling these people together. And so when we, coming back to the context of my youth leaders away for a weekend, we're reading this and studying this and praying through this, and we said, okay, it's like us. We've got all these people now. So many of them are new Christians, and there's way too many of them. What do we do? What do we actually do? Verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and, and distributing them, distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, do you see where I got the list of what I'm praying for? All of those eight things are right here. All of the things that God did. God captivated their hearts. God brought a sense of awe. God showed his miraculous power. God confirmed his presence. God gave them togetherness. God gave them joy. God gave them favor with other people. And he added new people every day that were getting saved. We came away from that weekend with an understanding of an interesting partnership. Because in this passage, I see things that they did and I see the things that God did. And what we desperately wanted to see was what God did. And we didn't know how to do it. So we said, let's do what they did. Does that make sense? So I want to take a minute here and I want to look actually at what they did. Because there's a great list of those things here too. They devoted themselves to teaching and learning. They devoted themselves to fellowship, and to communion, and to prayer. They devoted themselves to sharing everything. There was a common sense of together. Actually, I think there was a value change in their lives. And instead of living our lives for me and for my family, they had a bring and share attitude to life, to everything. I see that they committed themselves to removing the needs of people. I see authenticity. They were providing for needs. They were going to the temple. They were meeting in homes. They were eating together. They were praising God. And as we look earlier in the rest of that chapter, they went out to share the truth constantly. They were committed to people who needed Jesus. So the beginning word in this phrase, in this list, though, is they were devoted to these things. Ardent fervent, zealous, fanatical, enthusiastic, driven. They're all synonyms of devoted. So think about this passage of this list of things here and replace some of those words. They were fanatical about the apostles' teaching and prayer. They were fanatical about the awe for God. They were fanatical about sharing with each other and eliminating needs. And I look at myself and think, boy, how much are we driven by our happiness or our health or our comfort or our family or our hockey team? We become fanatics about a lot of things. So here in this great big list of things they did, I want to narrow it down to four things because in that list of things, I see common things. And so let's put them into four buckets. And I want to walk us through those four things because honestly, what I say 
and what we came away from in that weekend and I'll consistently hold to today, that if we will do these four things, I think we will be being obedient to what God wants us to do. I think we need these four things in our lives to grow as Christians. They are community, adoration, nurture, and service. And when, back to my youth group, whether we had a big group of 300 kids, or we had a meeting of 20 or 30, or a small group of four, or one-on-one mentoring, or a worship service, or time alone with God, the thing that tied all of those together, even though they were very different, the thing that tied all of those together were community, adoration, nurture, and service. And we became committed to saying every time we're together as a group, whether it's a group of two or a group of 300, we will focus on those four things. We will do those four things together. Let's look at them quickly. I won't take lots of time on each. But first is community. And this is really the journeying together. This is the together, the relationships experienced within a group. If we looked at Colossians chapter 3, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read a list of things. Paul writes about... Uh, in the church, he says, as God's chosen ones, put these things on like you put your clothing on. Put these on. And he says, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. Bear with one another. And if they have complaints, forgive each other. Above all, put on love. And then he says, peace. And thankfulness. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in wisdom. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts. And I I see that list of things. I put that together with John chapter 17, Jesus' prayer in the garden right before that he, he was arrested and crucified. And Jesus prays in that chapter for his followers. And he references these disciples, but then the people who would come to Christ through them and the generations far off that would follow. And his prayer is that they would be one together. The community, the aspect of that. So in Acts chapter 2, what do we see? There's a whole bunch of things that we see here as far as community goes. They spent time in temple courts every day together. They spent time in their homes together. They fellowship. They're eating together. They have everything in common. They're sharing and in unity. And as I said before, the value of a life value change to be a bring and share attitude towards life. It's like they would come home from work every day and everybody would get together. Not living in a commune. We didn't see that at all through the book of Acts. But we did see them do life together on a crazy, ridiculous scale. So what is the goal of community that I'm seeing here? The goal is not social. There's aspects of care and support, clearly, but there's way more than that. As we look at this, and we see what happened as the church grew through the book of Acts, there's no question that the goal of their community was an absolute transparency with each other. It was a safe place where I could be transparent. There was no faking it. If I was having a bad day, they knew it. I couldn't hide it. I couldn't fake it because we knew each other well enough. It's almost like giving permission to the other people to climb inside my head, kick around, to pull, to push, to crawl together to become more like Jesus. Then we're entering the zone of Christian community. A life group I was in a few years ago had a man in it who um, was starting to have all kinds of physical things happen in his body. And he was squashing what was going on. He put his happy face on. He didn't want to share Uh, But because we were building this kind of transparent community, he couldn't hide what was going on. He was crippled with stress and anxiety. And it was in our group together 
that we outed him. And he admitted what was going on at work and in his life and his stress with his kids and his family and all this kind of stuff. And he couldn't hide it anymore. Well, that allowed us to get it onto the table, to talk about it, to pray for each other, to work through it. We not only provided help, but strategies and solutions, and we walked together through it. Community. Community is more than social and caring and supporting, but we're clamoring together to become more like Jesus. The second thing I see is, called, is, is what I've called adoration. And I simply called it adoration because when we use the word worship in our culture, we default to music. And music is such a small part of what worship is. So I'm going to call it adoration for the sake of this because it's really a heart condition. And in real worship, God is the stimulus, not music, not nature. God is the stimulus because, as it said here, they were in awe of who God was. That's the stimulus. That's the source of worship. But it's not just that. God is the audience. It's got nothing to do with what I want or what I like or what I know. God is the audience. God is served, not me. God is valued. In adoration, adoration could be singing. But what other ways do we have that we can just express our love for God? To put it simply, we see here in Acts chapter 2, we see they, they did the Lord's Supper regularly. They were praising God. There was a sense of awe and wonder. God responded with, with miracles and wonders and confirmations of that. There was prayer. They were so wrapped up in God. They were so wrapped up in God and his goodness that everything else became pale. This is worship. So how do I do that in a group of 30 junior high boys? You want to think of an example of adoration? 30 junior high boys are not going to get a guitar and sit there and start singing, right? It's a unique, different perspective. So we had to start thinking, how do we do this? How do we accomplish this value, this scriptural intent in a group like that? One thing that we did was really, really simple. We decided that every time we were together, we're going to spend intentional time in the community, becoming transparent with each other. Every time we're together, we're going to have some time completely focused on God. That's how we defined our adoration. We're going to spend some time completely focused on get the me, get the I out of here. So how do we do that? Yes, we could sing. Yes, we could take a psalm and work through the psalm. We could have a conversation about what's your favorite characteristic of God? Maybe it's his mercy. Let's talk about that. His unconditional love. Let's talk. It gets me out of the way and it's God. So with junior high boys, it was as simple as for a little while, it's your turn, and you would bring a song, a recording of a song that makes you think about God. How easy is that? They w we would listen to the song together and have a conversation about what we think, what we, what, how that moves us, right? It, it's so simple. We don't have to get complicated with this, but expressing our adoration of God, putting our focus completely on him in an intentional way. That's what I mean by adoration, and I see that in, in Acts chapter 2. The third thing is nurture. This is the growing up part. We see this here with their, they fellowship together, but primarily they were devoted to the teaching and the life change aspect of it. The fellowship and the wonders and the value change and the bring and share attitude, the teaching, all of those kind of things. Ephesians chapter 4 gives a great picture of that said, here's the church, and God gave the church the different gifts and the different people and the different ideas and insights. Why? So we would grow up. So we would mature. Now, I chose to use the word nurture here very intentionally. Because when we think of nurture, what do we think about? We think about the little baby, right? And, and with a newborn, oh, there was one here this morning at 9 o'clock. With a newborn, can't even hold their own head up. And, and we nurture the child because we take that child from that state of absolute dependence 
to grow and learn and experience to their feeding themselves. They're taking care of their... It's not completely to independence, but that they can go from absolute dependence on someone else towards maturity, right? That's nurture, and it's a process, and it takes work. And instead of thinking Bible study, I want us to think nurture, as God nurtures us through each other and through his word. And it gives a different perspective. Here's an example. We could decide that on our Wednesday night Bible study, we're going to study the book of James. Lots of awesome life content in the book of James. Now, James has five chapters. So we could decide five-week study on the book of James. And the first week we'll do this chapter, we'll do this chapter, we'll do this. Or you get a book, and it's 11 chapters long, it's an 11-week study, and we'll, everybody read the chapter, we'll get together and talk about it, unpack it. That's awesome, and we do that all the time. But when we're driven by the curriculum in that sense, we've got to do this chapter here, we've got to do that. something crazy happens, oh, sorry, we've got to do chapter two. I'd far rather us think about it as nurture in the sake of becoming more mature in Christ which means my life is going to change, right? So what if we took the book of James and it took us maybe three years to finish it? Because there's so much in chapter one that we're not going to just do chapter one and go to chapter two. We're not leaving chapter one until I'm actually doing and practicing and living and experiencing those things. It might take us two or three years to get through the book of James. But folks, that's what I mean by nurture. We are nurturing each other mutually towards maturity in Christ. So what if every time we were together, in whatever size group, we were going to spend some time absolutely committed to community and some time absolutely committed to intentionally putting the focus only on God and some time absolutely committed to God nurturing us through his word and through other people, towards maturity and change. And then the fourth thing is service. I see here this in Acts chapter 2 really clearly, as they were absolutely committed to removing the needs of people around them. Whether it was people inside their church or outside the church, they were driven to remove needs. And service here starts with the attitude that the world is bigger than my little group. The world is bigger than my little group. They were committed to that. And I had to stop and ask myself this week, how am I actually engaged in removing the needs around me? In my life, in my family, in my neighborhood, in my small group, in our church, in our town, in our country? What about worldwide? Am I engaged in removing need worldwide? Well, our church is very engaged in Tai Tu, and many of you are supporting that all the time. In a school of grace and mission of hope, even more on shoe boxes at Christmas time, these are ways we are eliminating need, right? Even locally, with the Salvation Army and the food bank, uh, Lindenwood, uh, great examples of of removing need. But also, uh, in our benevolent fund, and cutting firewood, Cutting grass and setting up chairs, watching kids in the nursery or sitting on a prayer team, all of these things are ways that we engage to remove need. Am I right? We have two freezers in our, in our kitchen that for a long time, you people and others kept those stocked with, with pre-cooked meals so that when families were in need, we had them to go. Those are great ways that we can engage in meeting those needs. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, says that Jesus came to serve, not to be served. What if this was part of every time we got together? Intentionally thinking the the group, the world is bigger than our group. How are we going to do that? What would it look like then to be devoted to to be driven by those four things. What would that look like here on Sunday morning? 
community, adoration, nurture, and service. There's elements of those in the things we do on Sunday morning. But what if those four things we decided every time we're together, we're doing those four things? How would that change what we do on Sunday morning? What would that look like in your Bible study or in your life group or in your home church or your support group? Community, adoration, nurture, and service. What would that look like when, when a prayer team meets? Or the Wednesday morning men's prayer meeting. If we said we're committed to community, adoration, nurture, and service. What would that look like at a ladies' coffee group or a youth group or our nursery or our diamonds every time we're together? And I think I have really, over this whole process, grown to believe wholeheartedly that we need those four things in our lives if we're going to grow as a Christian. Those are the things that very intuitively... When Jesus gave them the instructions at the end of Matthew, go into the whole world, preach, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them what I taught you. That was the instructions to go and start the church. When they collected all these people, what are we going to do? These are the four things they did very intuitively. But remember I said it's a partnership because it's not all about what we do. It's all about what God does. So let's go back to that list. God captivated their hearts. God brought a sense of awe. God showed his miraculous power. God confirmed his presence. God gave them togetherness. God gave them joy. God gave them favor with outsiders. God added to their numbers every day people who were being saved. What does favor with people look like? God's Holy Spirit is present. The evidence is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Boy, if we were living that life full of the Holy Spirit and that was the evidence, when we walk into the grocery store or we walk into the, the car mechanic's place, secretly they're going to be going, yes, yes. That's the greatest, nicest, most loving, generous person I know. Right? That's Jesus. Be the church. This isn't go to church. This is be the church. This is right back where I started about half an hour ago. To pray for these eight things for our church. Is this your desire? If it is, you're in the right place. Will you join me in prayer? Actually, here's what I'd like to do. I would like to, to, to call us as a church to two things today. First, to be devoted to community, adoration, nurture, and service. That every time we're together, if it's two of us together, or 10 of us, or 50 of us, or 400 of us, to be devoted to community, adoration, nurture, and service. I think that would reshape what we do and who we are. The second thing is to call our church to pray for these things. Whatever our differences are, whatever our different opinions and backgrounds, different church histories, all this kind of things, when I look at this list of eight things that we could pray for our church, I see no reason for division that we are absolutely united on these things and desiring God to do this work in our church. So I want to ask you to pray for those things. Let's enter a partnership with God. Let's do what we see that these folks did. And let's ask God to do what he has done all along. Let's pray together. Father, let me again pray these same things. Captivate our hearts. Would you move in such a way? Would you be so real, so active, so obvious? God, grab us, grab our hearts, and captivate us.
bring us a sense of awe of who you are. Show us your miraculous power. Shower us with your miraculous power. And all of this, confirm your presence with us. We know you are here. We know you walk with us. God, every moment would you confirm your presence with us that we become driven by that. God, give us togetherness. No matter what we plan or no matter what we do, we can have all kinds of meetings and great games and icebreakers and all kinds. We cannot manufacture unity. That only comes from you. So God, would you give us togetherness? Would you give us joy? May we be a group of people, individuals collectively, marked by, characterized by joy. Give us favor with those on our street and our families, the people we work with and rub shoulders with all the time. God, may they see you in us. And would you build your church, not because people are changing churches, but because people are finding Jesus. Thank you for allowing us to be part of that process. And God, we will be faithful to do what you ask us to do fully anticipating and excited about seeing what you are going to do. Thank you. And thank you for a great church. In Jesus' name.